All right, so we've got a big section of scripture this morning. So uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of just like cut it up and and read it in sections. So I want to make sure that we take it all in. Um, I've been away for a little while, and so it's a real pleasure to come back and preach genealogies this morning. So that's good. We've got fish (laughs) under the sea. All right. Uh, Will you turn with me to Genesis chapter 4? We're going to start in verse 17. And... uh, And we're going to read to verse 26 for this first little section. It says this, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Uh, When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehuel, and Mehuel fathered Methushalel, and Methushalel fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives... The name of the one was Adar, and the name of the other was Zelah. Adar bore Jabul, who was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, who was the father of those who played the lyre and pipe. Zelah also bore bore Tubal Cain. He was a forger of instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was uh, Namath. Lamech said to his wives, Adar and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, uh, to Seth also a son was born, and his name was Enosh. At the time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, your word is good, and it is a real honor to be able to stop and reflect upon it this morning. God, I pray that you would use it by your Holy Spirit to change us, to cause us to rest in you, to find hope in you. And I pray that through it, you will search our hearts and reveal the corruption and the the mess that we often uh, buy into, Lord. And I pray, God, that as you do so, that you would, um, as the great physician, cut it out and cause us to uh, rest in and and look on you more, Lord God. So would you use these words for your glory in your mighty name? And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Memory is such an important aspect of uh, who we are. It's such an important aspect of... uh, what we do as a society, and in fact, you know, all I can see is everyone's looking up. <laughs> Maybe just turn it off the screen for now. We'll just... There's a button on the wall. On the, on the wall over here. There we go. Stefano knows. Hold it down. There we go. No? Yes. <laughs> Wow, very good. Uh, so memory is a really important aspect to human beings, like the, the ability to remember, and, and not just to like remember things like that I must do today, but to remember key aspects of our, uh, our society, of our story. That like remembrance is something that we are... Uh, uh, that is so important to us as, as a culture. And, and in fact, if you go across uh, multiple times in eras and nations and cultures, the, the ability of storytelling as the identity of a person and a people is something that is so important. You know, you can go to caves uh, that are, you know, thousands of years old and people have drawn and and uh, inscribed on those caves their story of a people, the things that define them. Now, what you will notice is, is that as we are going through this book of Genesis, is that it is a, it's a huge book of remembrance. It is, in fact, probably one of the key themes of Genesis is humans forgetting who they are and, and forgetting their story and forgetting where they've come from 
and, and then the detrimental aspects of society that follows after that. And so as, as we take a moment this morning to, to look at uh, this, this story in Genesis, and, and particularly as we will often come across as a, as a church in, in uh, the book of Genesis, is we look at genealogies, the things that, you know, generally when we get to it in our Bible, like, you know, yearly Bible plan, we're like, yes, this is a great opportunity for me to smash a few extra days through this, be honest, who's done that before? You're just like, I'm just going through like Jubal, Tubal, Hamach, Bishop, you know, like you're just getting through these names and you're like, I don't, I, I'm just going to say these words with confidence and people will think I know that I can speak Hebrew. <laughs> That's what I did. But really, there is, there is, they're in here for a reason. And, and it's not just to name key people, because often, actually, if you, if you take some time, that there's actually different types of genealogies. And, and scholars actually like froth their chops off when they get to, to genealogies, because it says a lot about a people. And it says a lot about what's going on in amongst the people. And so a lot of genealogies in the Bible are actually not complete genealogies. They're actually there to continue on, to continue the story of the people. And so therefore, as we, we come remembering that Scripture is God's grand story of redemption, we come to this genealogy, hopefully now with a little bit of anticipation, a little bit of excitement. Because what has happened is, is that in the verses preceding, is that Cain has killed Abel. And, and Abel has, uh, uh, sorry, Cain has then being cursed by God and him saying to God that you, you are to, to wander the earth, as in you're not going to find a home, you're not going to find a place for yourself. And, and so Cain, in true human form, when receiving the right, just judgment for what he's done, sooks about it. And, and, and is like, well, that's just not fair. Like, I, if someone's going to kill me now, well, let's just not forget that you just killed your brother and, and so the, the story then leads from, from Cain having to be exiled from the people. And uh, we then begin this little section by looking at the story of Cain through his genealogy. In fact, we, we learn a lot about his uh, story. And, and there's, there's three things I want to kind of center around in this little section. And then we'll move on and, and bring it to a close looking at uh, Adam's descendants all the way to Noah. So it says that Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And, and, and he then goes and names the city after his son. And, and instantly we see that from within this story that for, for Cain there is no honor of God. You know, like he's, he's constructed a place and he names it after his, his, his own son, that his... his uh, he is about the advancement of his family line rather than the, the glorification of God and his image-bearing line, right? And so um, the first thing that we, we actually start to see in this story is, is that although human advancement continues, right? Like they, he goes on and he, he, he describes his three sons to his, um, to his two wives. Um, we see that... Um, they are the, the people who advance culture through music. And then we see that the people who, who advance technology in, in building and construction through um, making instruments of bronze and iron. And then we also see that um, farmers and, and people who look after and rule over livestock are then also come from this line. And so advancement comes through this family. Like we, we see... Uh, that um, there is great human advancement, but the problem is that tied to this human advancement, or despite how much things are advancing, sin and depravity still remains. We notice that in, even in his, his song, he is talking about vengeance. He, he's, he's talking about and taking part in the very sin that his, fa like his father's taken part in. And in fact, he... If you look at this, this poem, he's actually um, celebrating it to the fact of like, well, you know, well, if, if his, his is sevenfold, well, mine's 77-fold. Like, my, I, am, I, I have more vengeance than what Cain has. So, so as the human uh, advance and there's progress going on, what we see is actually sin progresses in, at the same rate, if not more. 
And so we need to understand something really clearly that it doesn't matter how much technologically we advance as a society, we still can't get rid of the systemic issue that's in within all of us, which is original sin. Like we can, we can advance in all kinds of psychology, psychiatry, all kinds of medicine. We can advance in all kinds of building and construction. And culturally, we can advance to the point where there's no such thing as anything anymore. And we could, we could get to this point, but ultimately in the end, it, it, it cannot deal with the issue of the sin that dwells within us. There's, there's, there's no remedy within humanity to that. And, and, and in this genealogy, we, we see that, that, that this depravity continues. We see the first, uh, um, the first introduction to uh, polygamous relationships. And, and, and if you think about it, this is a direct violation to what God had taught uh, uh, Cain's mum and dad. That there was a husband and a wife who will cleave together and become one flesh. Now, we're not that far down the line and that society is already being in complete disobedience and buying into to polygamy as being the way to go. Now, um, this, this, this has been... Um, it's, it's something that often when people talk about the Bible, they go, well, this is a, this is a big issue because um, the Bible doesn't openly reject polygamy. You know, in fact, there's some of the great um, forefathers of our faith, like Jacob. Uh, you know, we look at Solomon, who had about 300 wives with 600 concubines. And, you know, we hear all these stories about these, these people. But what you need to understand is, is that just because, because God doesn't make comment on it in Scripture doesn't mean that in Scripture it's painted rightly. A lot of the time in Scripture, it's just presented to us. But you also need to understand that as Scripture goes, you see that whenever there's polygamy involved, there is always sin and destruction that goes on for, for all of the parties involved. And in fact, as you go through Genesis, you'll see when, when, when Abraham takes part in it, we have this whole line of Ishmael that comes and becomes a, a massive thorn in Christianity's side. You'll see it in, in, in Jacob with, with his two wives. Now, God ultimately redeems the sin of these people, but it's never held up as a good thing. In fact, it's, it's shown as a rejection of God's good design that he has for us. That actually, when there's one husband and one wife, that is where the wife is most protected and secure and children are most looked after and thrive in those conditions. The more we add and change those things, it, it adds our pain. We also see then that this depravity grows because what uh, Lamech does, who's the, the seventh member of this line, and, and, and it, especially in genealogies, you know, like the numbering of people is really important for us to understand. Number seven is, is supposed to be like the, the the perfect. It's the number of the perfect, right? And so this is uh, what, the, what the, the writer of this is wanting us to see is, okay, let's, let's pause this and have a look at the best of this line. It's Lamech. And so Lamech celebrates with his polygamous wives the fact that he is so caught up in his own way and his own agenda, he will kill anyone or anything that gets in his way. Anyone or anything that, and, and, and his words are, who, who, for wounding me or for striking me. Uh, he, he not only says a man, which is the, the word, so I've killed a man. This is in verse 23, for wounding me. And then he says, a young man for striking me. This, this terminology, young man, is actually young child. Like, so he's, what he's talking about here is, is that if anything is a threat to me, or mine, I will destroy it. I don't care. Man, woman, child, it doesn't matter. If it gets in my way, there will be consequences for that thing. And so uh, he, he gathers his family around and he shares with them a, a song and a poem about this vengeance. He, he then also marvels at the fact that his vengeance is greater than God's vengeance. 
Because with Cain, when, when Cain uh, sinned and God said, I'll put a mark on you and protect you, Cain, is God who would enact that vengeance, not Cain. But now Lamech, in his pride and arrogance, is saying that my vengeance will be greater than God's vengeance. Because what I d- deserve and what uh, me and, and, and what I'm about, ultimately, um, I am my own God and I can a- enact my own kind of justice. He doesn't need God for that. And so already we see that as that line goes on, and as that line progresses, we see that they are already godless, that they are already opposed to him and his, uh, God's way of life and are openly mocking him about it. The last thing we see in that, in that depravity is the danger of generational sin. There's a, there's a saying that, you know, that's often recited that the, you know, the, the hidden sins of the father become the sins that the children celebrate. And we see that already within a few verses. That to, to kill an image bearer of God for Lamech, is, it's nothing. It's just vengeance. To, to take on more wives and to subjugate them to your will, it means nothing because it's all about me and mine. All in the name of progress that Lamech celebrates. What we also then see, even in amongst all of this, is God's general grace. God's general grace. Yes, society is advancing, but it is actually through the advancement of secular societies that God's rule also advances. Isn't it interesting that the things that they notice, so it's livestock, music, and music and culture that's tied in together, and then also um, instruments of silver and gold, that if if we go further into... um, Exodus, right? So that the, those of you who are learning the books of the Bible with, their children, you're with your children, it goes Genesis. Good job. So the next book that comes along after that, right? In Exodus, we see that God redeems the very things that these societies set up. He uses, and in fact, the first time he ever uses that the Spirit of God comes upon someone is someone who uses bronze and silver to make instruments for God's worship. Psalms are full of people saying, make a joyful noise, play your instruments, your lyre and your pipe, like David. Then, and, and then also the livestock, which is the, the identity that the Israelites end up picking up, becomes a central aspect of their worship for God as they sacrifice living creatures to, uh, to uh, display the atoning work that God would do for them. And so what I just find is so amazing is that this secular society is pushing on in their progress. But what God does is he takes that progress and he redeems it and uses it for his glory. Now, this is also, we we get to see this even in our society. Like government institutions, like democracy and stuff like that have come out of secular society but God what God does is is by his general grace which is his redeeming sovereign hand over all things is that he uses that to make sure that the that the earth doesn't fall into chaos and so despite the evil intentions of these people God is still sovereign despite their open mockery of him naming cities after their own, singing about their own vengeance and protection. Despite all of these things, God in his love and mercy uses it for the glory of his name. God uses secular ideas. God uses arts and governments for his glory. He provides general, governmental, providential grace uh, to prevent uh, chaos that's going on. And this is this should be like this is good news for us. 
This is good news for us because we, we, we serve a God who, who is so gracious and kind and mercy, merciful that he's given all of humanity this image-bearing nature, right? He's given that to all of us. And so therefore there's creativity and there is, there's beauty to be had in all things that are created. Now that's not to say that everything's redeemable. There are some things that are, as God clearly says in the word, are an absolute abomination and should be destroyed. But it is important for us to understand as a church that, it, that, that there's a reason why God commands us to be obedient to, obedient to government, even secular governments, because it is God uses his ruling hand through those things. In Romans, he, de- he describes that the, the Roman emperor is his sword used for his judgment. And so, therefore, we, we, we look on at this, this general grace and we should marvel that God would, despite the open mocking of him, that he would keep people alive for his glory to, so that society can go forth and so that people can still know him. And this is, this is a, a wonderful picture of the God of grace that we serve, that he can use all things for his glory and he keeps all things for his glory. As, as, as uh, Jesus says in Matthew 5 in his great Sermon on the Mount, he says, the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. Now, this is where this doctrine can be difficult for you and I. Because we see this open mockery, right? And we, we, we'll see it throughout as we go further. But how it's tough for us to deal with this. How is it that unjust people can still survive? How, like, how is it that these people who... who you know, like, don't even want to acknowledge God, are just not struck down in any moment? How is it that God doesn't just, like, rain down fire and brimstone like he, he does in, in, the, in, the New, um, in the Old Testament on Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, like, we can struggle with this. We can look at businesses and we can look at, you know, societal things that are going on. And it can be really tough for us to understand of going, well, why is it that God would allow for those things to continue on does, you know, why would he allow rain to fall on both sides of the camp? Why isn't it that he just blesses his own? And, and, and again, this is to call us and push us to understand the great grace and mercy that, we, that our God has. That we actually can benefit from these things for his glory. But also, in, in, in amongst all that, we should actually see God's active judgment going on. Because as God allows these groups and, and, and allows people within their sin to take, to, to take part in that sin and to get what they want, this is, an, this is an active work of God's judgment in their life. He's like, okay, you want that? Okay, I'm going to allow you to have that. And this is actually a hand of God's judgment. You want, you want wealth and, and finance and you're going to glorify that? Okay, have it all. See what happens to you. You want corruption? You, you, want, you want to take part in all, in all? Okay, cool. It's all your... See what happens. And it's actually we see God's work of judgment in society where, that when, he is, when it is seen that he is blessing these people, this is actually a work of God's hand in judgment. Because ultimately, right, it works in two ways. They, they, they get all of these things and, and in time realize what a bitter pill they ultimately are. We actually get a really good um, look at this in the book of Ecclesiastes because there's Solomon who has all things and has stepped away, has been, his heart has been led away from all of those wives that he's had because they were all from other nations and they were not worshipping the one true God. He is miserable. Like the, the key idea to that book of Ecclesiastes is like, don't, rain, don't read this on a rainy day. That should, that's what it should just say in the cover of the thing, because it's like, the main thing is this, this word called chesed, which is meaningless. Everything's vanity. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And, so, and therefore, as they, they get everything that they long for, all, all that they desire, they realize it's meaningless. It's pointless. And the problem is, is that a lot of the time it comes too late. It comes way too late. And so we, we, we see that, that that's then God's judgment on, on them in that. 
It always leads to destruction. And, and we'll see, you know, spoiler alert, you know, we'll get to uh, Genesis 6 and it doesn't go well for those societies. God then also then uses that as a, a sanctifying tool for you and I. Because as, as we look on and, and we can look on at them and think, well, what horrible ideas. Like we can think of Lamech as he's, he's, you know, like there with his wives. You can almost see the pomp, you know, you can almost see the pride oozing from him as he's saying these things, you know, like, yeah, I've got my, I can, I'll get my own vengeance. And he's just like, oh, I just want to slap you, silly. And, and we can look on, and when we look on at this, what it should cause us to do is it should strike fear in our own hearts. Because this family, like this family, this, that Cain's line, is, is this same sin is present in you and I. Let's, let's be honest here. Like as we do most of the time in Scripture, we kind of try to find ourselves in Scripture. I hate to break it to you. We're Lamech. Like, we're not some narrator watching on going, oh, he's a naughty boy. Like, wow. That's... No, no, we're Lamech. Like, that, that, that stuff is present in our own hearts. Outside of Christ, like, we are sitting there with our multiple wives and children talking about how we're, gonna, we're willingly going to lay down the lives of everyone else around us for our own agenda. And so, therefore, we should read this, and it should strike fear in our hearts. And it should cause us to take a moment and, and look inwardly at ourselves that we might not be lured into the material success outside of God. Like how often do we as people buy into that of thinking, well, okay, the, the world's idea of success, you know, the church often buys into that and goes, yeah, that's success. As many, as many people as I can get in and into a room, as much money as I can get into the coffers, as, as much, uh, you know, uh, work as I can get to get identity. Like, we buy into this all the time. Now, we may not be wielding a sword and cutting suckers down, but we, we very much are sacrificing our families on the altar to the, the things that we worship every single day. And so, therefore, we should look on at that and go, Lord, is this present within me? You know, like, ultimately, right? Like, if we, if we, we, we let's... Get, Let's get real for a second here. Like This here, what we're talking about with this guy is saying here, it's, it's, it's the issue of abortion right there in front of us. It's our will and what I want and the satisfaction that I'm looking for in my own life or I'm not ready for it right now or whatever, but I still want to freely take part in the action that creates those things. That's okay because what I can do is I can just get rid of that burden now, that's, that's, that's where our society's got to. And, and so, therefore, we should, we should be fearful of that present within our own lives. Like, are, are you looking for that, that level of satisfaction that is sung and, 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 and spoken about here in the, in the material things that God has provided you? Like parents, are you sacrificing your role in raising your children to know and love God? Are you sacrificing that for the sake of your own financial identity, vocational position? Because ultimately, when you stand before God, you're going to go meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Now, don't get me wrong. God calls us to steward what we're given well. We're supposed to be hard-working amigos. Like, we're supposed to be those, those, those in society that people look on going, I want to employ that girl or that guy. Absolutely. Like, that is what we're called to do. But there is a difference between working well and sacrificing everything for that place. And so, therefore, as we look on at Lamech, it should cause us to that, that, that very same fear to take part in our lives. Now, if that means we have to make sacrifices, 
If that means that we actually have to give up that that high-paying position for the sake of ultimately our family, it means that we can't have the niceties that this world has to offer, well, that's okay because ultimately, in the end, the most important thing is... The the most important thing, right, is, is to know and be known by God, right? We can at least say that in this room. And so it should cause us, our hearts, to just check it, to just lay it before God and say, is this present within me? And I hope that then it ultimately keeps you up at night and causes you to do something about that. Oh, may our hearts read this and tremble. All right, let's go. Let's carry on. Genesis chapter 5. We're going to finish this, I promise. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, male and female who created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam uh, after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. That's all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, if you don't mind, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Then Enosh had lived 90 years. He fathered Kenan. Enosh lived with his, uh, lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. When Enosh had lived 70 years, he fathered, fathered Mahalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. When Mahalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalel lived after he fathered Jared uh, 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalel were 895 years and he died. When Jared lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 80 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years and then he died. When Enoch had had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, sorry, and, and he was not. For God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years. He fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham and Japheth. Okay, so we then go on to the line of Adam. We see, right, that this line of Lamech is like this, 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 this sin and this corruption that's taking place. But then the Bible does something really interesting. It doesn't connect these lines because really they're they're kind of connected. It it separates it and it kicks off and it it first of all begins by outlining again, right, that that they'd come from the image of God. But he's he's saying, right, that this image, this this closeness to God is going to go through this line. When when he says that, you know... um, that God made him in, in his image and his likeness. And then, of course, Adam then has a father's a son in his own likeness after his own image. What, he, what he's saying is, is, in fact, that the image of God is continuing. It's not that it just dies and ends with Adam. That actually, those that follow after him are indeed um, image bearers as well. And so we see that this line then uh, uh, continues. Uh, 
there's some real big giveaways that this, this line is supposed to be different. For example, Eve talks about when she names her son Seth, which means appointed, he names Seth and, and says that God has given. As much opposed to um, with Cain, she speaks about like, oh, God has, has helped me. And so for Eve, she's acknowledged the fact that it's actually God who's outlining, outlining these things. And um, the other big interesting thing that happens in this genealogy is there's time given to everyone. You notice the ages? They're old. And if you ever want to do good in a Bible quiz, just remember Methuselah. He's the oldest person named in the Bible. He's 969 years old. But so Methuselah uh, and, and all the other characters here, they're given age and time. And this is... Uh, given for a few reasons, but the main one is to point out to us is that these people, they're given value and time. Like their years are numbered. Like there's a, there's a closeness to watching over these people. It, this, this time is not given to us so that we can figure out the age of the earth or something along that line. Like that's not what it's there for us to do. And actually there's probably a bit of evidence to show that this is a broken... Uh, Genealogy. So its point is not to do that, but it's more that these people lived at this time, at this age, and God knew every single moment of those times. He knew those years. And even though they're not named in here, God knew it. But something really interesting happens in this genealogy. There's a slight pause. And for those of you who are playing along at home, you'll realize that it's number seven in this genealogy. And so the writer of the book holds up Lamech as number seven of that opposing line and is like, well, this is who we've got in this line. And then all of a sudden there's this other character that comes along whose name's Enoch. And he appears in verse uh, 21 and it says something really interesting about him. It says that Enoch walked with God twice. It says he walked with God and your father Methuselah. And then it says, in this really bizarre verse, in verse 24, it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, but God took him. Now, this, this line goes into great detail to talk about the age that these people live, but every single one of them dies. And so they're image bearers of God, but also sin and corruption has been passed on to all of them. Like, they're, they're all dying. But then all of a sudden this character, the, the, the seventh person in this line appears and his name's Enoch and it says that he walks with God and then he, he's taken. Now the repetition of this is supposed to scream at us to stop and have a look. What's different about this man and what is different about this line? It's, a, it's supposed to call us to say that this line is different and that this line, they are walking in a closeness to God. This, this phrase that's used, um, that he walked with God, is only used twice in the Old Testament, or three times. Two of them are with Enoch, and the other one's with Noah. So first of all, we've got to gather, what do they mean? What does he mean by saying, well, walk with God? Because there's the, you know, it often says he walks before the Lord, or he followed after the Lord. But to walk with God, that language is, is, is different, and it's different for a purpose. Uh, to, so to walk before God or to walk after God was directly related to living a blameless, ethical and moral life. Like it's, it's like piety. Like they were moral people. They were doing the right thing. So to walk with God, the language that, is, that it, this is supposed to point us to is the fact that Enoch walked as a companion with the Lord. So it's not just about like being good. And following a certain way, but it actually speaks of an intimacy with the Lord, a closeness with God. That uh, that this 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 person, this Enoch, actually uh, lives and plea is and pleases God by living close to God and close to His heart. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter eleven. And I won't get you to go there um, unless you're really quick. Uh, just because of time. Because we're given no other information about Enoch except for when we get to Hebrews. And in, in verse 5 of 11 says this. By faith Enoch was taken up 
so that he should not see death. And he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was command, commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. So whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we get a bit of a taste of what, what that walking with the Lord is. It's to have faith. Now, what, is, what does the Bible describe that faith is? It, it describes that, that this faith is to believe that God exists. So to believe that God is who he says he is. And it says to believe that he rewards those who seek him. And so what, what God finds sweet is, is, is not just that we believe that you know, there's a God out there, but we believe that the God of the Bible is exactly who he says he is. Who is this God what do we do to follow him? And what does that look like? That's what this is intimacy is resting upon. And then also says that he believe, we believe that he rewards those. Now, to believe that he re- re- rewards those is also to believe the opposite of that, right? So if you believe that God rewards those who follow him, it also believes that uh, he passes judgment on those who don't follow him. Which is then there's another quote written by about Enoch or, and what he's supposed to have said in Jude chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. It says, Behold the Lord, um, it says this, it, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that uh, that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. This helps us color in even further what, what it is to actually walk with God. To, that to actually what Scripture lays out before us in this line, and, and particularly in Enoch, is, is saying that to Walk with God is not necessarily to um, to live as a uh, pious, you know, to moralist, but it's actually to to know that God exists and to pursue and want to know His heart. Like that, that is a really different idea than what we see in religion, right? Because in religion, is that if there's a God, you obey and you follow what they say because otherwise you might get it in the neck. But ultimately, what, what, what the gospel leads us to understand is, is that actually real righteousness is to, to, to live so closely to God that we, we understand his heart so much so that we walk in step with that heart. And so therefore, it's not some legalistic idea of like, don't do this, do that. You know, A plus B equals God's going to be happy with you. But it's actually dwell close with God and allow the things that are important to Him to actually direct your life. Now, there's, there's obviously there's judgment attached to that because if you're living in, in disobedience, of course you're going, to get, you're going to get the wrath of God. Of course you are. But, but the call of the life of Enoch is, is actually one to call us to actually rest in this righteousness. So what do we do then? Because we know, right, that we lean way more on the side of Lamech. Like, what hope is there for us? Well, John calls us and, and tells us that, um, that to, have, to have eternal life is that we would know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Okay, so for us to be able to receive this righteousness, this this righteousness that this line is calling us to, is to actually believe in the work of what Christ has done for us. And this is what we've been celebrating all morning, is this steadfast love that endures forever. 
is that God knows that we, even in our best, are like, you know, Lamech 2.0. But he says, I'm going to provide a way. And so that those who would trust in me, I'm going to put them in this line of Enoch. And they will receive eternal life and will not experience death as anyone else will experience. See, the, the beauty is, is, is this genealogy calls us to Christ. It calls us to ultimately re reflect on the fact that we are not good enough, but he is good enough. And that through this line that we get Noah, and then from Noah's line, and then what follows onto them, we get Abraham. And then from Abraham's line onwards, we ultimately, it leads us, as what Scripture is wanting us to do, is leads us to Christ and calls us to put our hope and trust in Him so that we can be welcomed to be a part of His family. Church, at our best, with all our, our culture, with all our creation, with all of our building, and all of those things ultimately will lead to our destruction if we are outside of Christ. And so we must, with fear and trembling, look at this life of, of these people and see where this genealogy is ultimately wanting to call us to, which is to ultimately rely on Christ and rest wholly on Him and Him alone. He's our, he's our only hope. Your family line can't save you. The fact that you're sitting here in this room cannot save you. It is only by trusting and believing that Christ is the one that the Father sent to us and it is by His sacrifice on the cross and His life, His death and resurrection and through that and that alone that we can be saved. I love there's this little poem, and I'm going to wrap it all up, by this um, poet called Lucy Shaw, and she writes this beautiful little poem about Enoch. It says this, Enoch crossed the gap another way. He changed his pace, but not his company. Enoch crossed the gap another way. He changed his pace, but not his company. You know, that we through Christ can have the same company as Enoch. <laughs> and so I guess as we reflect on this, my call to you as the church is that we would make our life about that company. May we make changes and, 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 and effects in our life so that we can walk closely with God. Can we just stop judging our lives based upon what might be cool on Instagram or the newspapers or whatever social engagement you take part in? Can we just stop with that? And can we like, align ourselves with what actually really matters and that is to, to know and be known by God? Because in the end, ultimately, we're all going to die. And either that death is going to be like closing our eyes to the closest thing we'll ever get to hell, and we'll open our eyes and there will be our saviour waiting for us. Or it goes from okay to even worse. And so may we heed these words really seriously. Uh, we're going to take some communion together, so if our communion crew can prepare that for us, Really is a much better time for us to take communion and then after reflecting on this. That Christ would come in this enduring love and would, would actually, uh, as, as communion remembers for us, give up his body, which is to, to live the life we never could. And then to die bodily in our place like the, the substitute in our position, and then give us this righteousness that we don't deserve, this closeness that we get to have with God. We celebrate that by taking part in that bread. And then, then by, by the, the, the wine or the grape juice that we, t we have together in communion is to celebrate that atoning blood, that, that covering blood that he's given us, that... that now that when God sees us, he, he sees us as one of his own in his family because of this atoning work. That we're not just set free from 
sin and just left to go do our own devices, but we're actually set free from that and now free to know God rightly for ourselves. And so as we take communion uh, this morning, firstly, uh, let's reflect on that. Let's take some time to reflect as we sing about God and, and, and who he is and what he's done for us. But then I would also say that if you would say this morning that you are not in Christ, you, you would not believe as what Jesus calls us to in, in John 17, that, that Christ came and he died and to set you free. If you don't believe that this morning, will you just let communion pass you by? Because this is something that we do as, as Christians to celebrate this. And, but I would call you that let today be the day that you respond to that. Let today be the day of your salvation. Come and join this family that um, will ultimately will not see death, which is a, a wonderful gift of God. Why don't you stand with me and then Let me pray for you. And then let's uh, eat together and drink together. Father, we're grateful for your word. and We're grateful that even in a, a genealogy you call us to repentance. We're grateful that you would love us and care for us enough to cause us to remember whose we are and where we've come from this morning. Thank you that you've brought us into your family. Lord, we're, um, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will convict us of the sins in our lives, Lord God, would, would convict us of the, prior, like the pride and the, the arrogance that we've, we've bought into, that we just think is right. Help us, Lord God, that to rest uh, in your salvation by bringing these sins and laying them at your feet. Help us to take part in true repentance by walking away from those things and changing whatever needs to change. Um, we love you, Lord. And as we take this communion together, we just pray that you would just be glorified. Help us to worship you well and to find real hope and peace in what you have done for us over what we could try and do for ourselves. We love you, Lord. Amen.